Tonight, a landmark town hall. The president and the people. You don't know what it's like to be me. What it's like to be me. To be me. To be me. You don't know what it's like to be Eric Garner's daughter and have to live with his death every day. Treated with disrespect every time a white person looks at you. My greatest fear is that he will lose his life protecting his community. Now, a national conversation about race, about policing. Automatically, when I think of police, I think power, I think fear. About how we bridge the divide. After just one week in America, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I had to stop watching because it made me sick to my stomach. Stay with me. Outside Minneapolis, the live stream on Facebook. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. It sent shockwaves through my soul. Policemen were just dropping. The targeting of police officers in Dallas. These are the heroes that I work with every day. What will it take for a nation to understand each other? to protect each other, to listen to each other. Every life in this country means something. Every life. Tonight, family members, police officers, mothers and fathers, their children. It takes a leap of faith to get past divisions. Americans from all over this country and their questions for the president. For this conversation, we'll have to be there. To be honest. Respectful. To be uncomfortable. No question. Off limits. I would ask President Obama. Mr. President. Mr. President. Mr. President, can you help me keep our children alive? A national conversation begins now. Good evening. I'm David Muir, and we are here tonight for an honest and challenging conversation between the president and the people. So many of the families who have gathered right here in this room have been directly affected by what we've seen in this country in recent days. Loved ones lost during a police encounter. Police officers who did not return home from work. We all witnessed what has transpired in just one week in America. Baton Rouge, Minneapolis, and Dallas. And sadly, we all know what came before. New York City, Ferguson, Baltimore, and the list goes on. This is a critical moment for this president and this country. We watched the president in Dallas telling Americans we are not as divided as we seem. We should note here that we asked the White House if President Obama would be willing to do this. They did not arrange this. He said yes. Nothing is off limits, a true and hopefully constructive conversation. So we welcome our viewers tonight in the U.S. and around the world, across our Disney media networks, ABC, ESPN, Freeform, live streaming on Facebook, Yahoo, and YouTube. And we're being carried worldwide tonight by our partners at the BBC. We welcome you all. And of course, we welcome the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Mr. President, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. And before we begin this conversation here tonight, a bit of a guideline for everyone in the room. We're not going to retry any of the cases that we have seen in the news, but we are here to acknowledge that Americans in this country, depending on your race, your background, do see things, do hear things differently from one another. But tonight, we try to hear it and see it the same way. So we thought we would begin with where the news began a little more than a week ago, Mr. President, and that was with what we saw in Baton Rouge. We saw Alton Sterling tackled to the ground. He was then shot and killed. His son Cameron, who is 15 years old, stood before the country, breaking down in front of the cameras. Take a look. My son is not the youngest. He is the oldest of his siblings. He is 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> he had to watch this as this was put all over the outlet. Cameron, I know it is difficult for you to hear that, but Cameron is with us here tonight. And if you would stand, I know in the last 24 hours you have made a plea to this country to come together. And I'm curious what you would like to say and to ask of the president. I've come here to ask one question. I ask that you keep all of these families and my family safe and the people and the rest of the the rest of the good police officers safe from bad people and bad police officers and i want and i ask for your help to unite all the races of this world wow 
Uh, th l let me just first of all say, uh, obviously, how proud uh, we are of you, Cameron, to be able to be here and speak. Uh, I couldn't have done that when I was 15, uh, particularly in these circumstances. Uh, so I know your family's proud of you. Um, let me say to all the people who are here uh, who have been impacted in some fashion by not just tough events this week, but tough events in the past. Uh, I know we've got uh, families from Baton Rouge and Minnesota. We also have uh, the widows of police officers who are here uh, and know the incredible uh, risks that police officers take every single day uh, in terms of trying to protect us. Uh, I just came back from Dallas uh, a couple of days ago where I was hugging and spending time with uh, spouses and children uh, of those who've been lost. And I, I think the, the thing you expressed, Cameron, is what I meant when I said the country's not as divided as it seems. In communities all across the country, there is real concern about making sure that interactions between uh, police and community uh, don't result in death. And nobody wishes that more than police officers themselves. Because when you talk to those police officers who uh, have, whether justified or not, whatever the findings, have ended up killing somebody, uh, it shatters them too. I don't know anybody in the African-American community uh, or Latino community or others that may have concerns about policing that don't also recognize we need police and are heartbroken when they see what happens in a place like Dallas. And so the, the question is how do we channel what I believe are good spirits and good feelings and, and a sense of common humanity, how do we channel that into our institutions and how our police are uh, structured and trained and how the community is working with them so that these things don't happen with the kind of frequency that they do. And we don't want our children to have to witness this. I mean, the one thing that I'm, I'm certain of, because I've seen it in the White House, even with my younger staff, they've been shaken in ways that uh, makes me want to parent them a little bit uh, and, and tell them it's going to be okay. Uh, and I don't want a, a, a generation of young people to grow up thinking either that they have to mistrust the police or alternatively that, uh, that the police who are doing a good job and out there taking care of their communities that uh, they're constantly at risk, not just from criminals, but also because the community mistrusts them. But uh, because of the history of this country and the legacy of race and uh, you know, all the, the, the complications that are involved in that, working through these issues so that things can continue to get better is going to take some time. Um, but I'm confident they will, and part of the reason I'm confident about that is because I'm meeting young people like you uh, who... Uh, honor your father well by making sure that uh, you're, you're speaking generously to police officers uh, as well as, you know, dealing with your own grief. So, really proud of you. Thank you. Cameron, thank you. Very brave of you to come tonight. Mr. President, you know, there's a, a discussion ar around whether or not what's been captured on these smartphones and these cell phones is really revealing a culture that has existed all along. We just now have the technology to capture it. And we're joined by Diamond Reynolds, who, of course, uh, very calmly went to live stream on Facebook after the death of her boyfriend. And she's outside Minneapolis. She wanted to be here in the room with you, but she attended the funeral just today. And Diamond, I'm curious what you would like to ask the president. Well, first, I'd like to say hi, Mr. President. It is a pleasure to meet you. I am honored by you. Um, you're a role model for myself, Philando, and my daughter, and the rest of my family. So when I think about my daughter's future, I'm scared for her. So my question is, 
how do we as a nation stop what has happened to my family and all the other victims across the world? Well, we appreciate uh, uh, you appearing, uh, and, and you know, I, I know this is a, a difficult time. Um, my heart goes out to all the families who've been impacted, um, and, and I can only imagine what you're going through, uh, and that's true for uh, everybody who, uh, who's been impacted over this last uh, week and a half. Um, I think that the, the place to start is for everybody to recognize that we need police officers and we need those police officers to be embraced by the community. If there are good relations between police and those communities, then the communities are going to be safer and police officers will be safer. It's good for everybody. So we should have a common goal. In order for us to make sure that we reduce the number of incidents like we've seen, there are a couple of things that we know work. Number one, the more police departments know the communities and get to know those communities ahead of time, the more trust is built. Point number two is police departments that are doing the best work are also training their officers not just on shooting, not you know, being good shots, not just on uh, the technical aspects of police work, but they're also training officers about how do we get rid of some of our implicit biases. And we all have them. Black folks have them, white folks have them. We, we all carry around with us some uh, assumptions about other people. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, that, uh, that because of the history of our country uh, and, and because of the images we receive as we're growing up, et cetera, oftentimes there's a presumption that black men are dangerous. And so that has to be worked through. And police officers who uh, are, are getting that training end up being able to engage and de-escalate encounters more effectively. So that's the second thing that has to happen. Number three. We've got to provide police uh, departments more resources so that they can implement some of these best practices. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that training, for example, is expensive. So we're going to have to make sure they're, they've got budgets, that they've got you know, the, the proper equipment to protect themselves. Uh, we've got to make sure that uh, there are enough police so that they don't feel undermanned. That makes a difference. We've got to make sure that police have due process. They've got a tough job. But we also have to make sure that people have confidence that if something happens, that it's going to be investigated fairly and properly. So there are a whole bunch of components to this, and we all have an obligation uh, to participate. It can't just be uh, all on the police. It's also got to be on the community. It's also got to be on civic leaders. It's got to be on churches. It's got to be on uh, elected officials to try to create these kinds of conversations before crises happen. Because so often we wait until something bad happens and then we react. And then everybody's emotions are high and everybody's angry and hurt. And what we want to do is to have those conversations before something bad happens. If you implement best practices, police officers are safer, the community is safer, and uh, the community feels more confident uh, that this is our police and not somebody else's police. You bring up the strides that they have made in Dallas. The police chief is attending funerals, uh, but we do have Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick from Texas here with us tonight. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, you, you said, please stand, please stand. You said after what we saw in Dallas that some of the protesters were hypocrites for running from the scene and the expectation that the police officers would then protect them. I know that since then you have said you would have chosen different words. But you have been critical about leadership in this country, not having the backs of our police officers. I'm curious what you mean by that and what sure. you would like to see from the president. Sure. Uh, first of all, Mr. President, um, uh, as Lieutenant Governor of Texas, like you, uh, I have some people that really like me and some people that really don't. Um, but the police officers in Texas know without question, regardless of their political party, that they have my support 
and I have their back. I'm concerned that police officers across the country, they know you support law enforcement, of course, but do they really in their heart feel like you're doing everything you can to protect their lives? Um, yesterday, you had meetings at the White House, mm -hmm. and afterwards you said the tension between the police and between black America is only going to get worse. Words matter. Your words matter much more than mine. Everything you say matters. And I would ask you to consider being careful when there is an incident of not being too quick to condemn the police without due process and until the facts are known. I know that's not your intention, but again, words have meanings. And the other thing I'd like to say tonight, consider when you go home to the White House, to put on the blue lights. The police have asked you to do that. You've done it for other groups. It would send a strong message. I first of all say uh, that I have been unequivocal in condemning any rhetoric directed at police officers. So I think, uh, Lieutenant Governor, you'd have to find uh, any message that did not include a very strong support for law enforcement. In all my utterances dating back to Ferguson, because I rely on law enforcement to protect me and my family, just like everybody else does. Uh, so I appreciate the sentiment. I think it's already being expressed. But uh, I'll, I'll be happy to send it to you in case you missed it. Mr. Yeah. President, I know you have. I just want them yeah. to know it in their heart. The, 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 let, me, let me respond to the points uh, that you've made. Um, the second point is that I have also insisted throughout all these processes that law enforcement is deserving of due process just like everybody else. So no matter how powerful videos may be or what's been said, everybody deserves to be treated fairly by the justice system. And I have, and Michelle has, police officers in our family. And we know what a tough job they have. And we want to make sure that when incidents happen, however they look, that we have to take a breath and see what exactly has occurred. Now, Lieutenant Governor, what I have said is that the data and this is not just stuff I make up. I, I, uh, I'm aware that my, my words matter deeply here. The data shows that there are disparities in terms of how uh, persons of color and whites are treated in the aggregate. That doesn't mean in any individual case there's discrimination. It just means that across a lot of different situations, uh, there are discrepancies. And that those aren't good for building trust or making people feel as if they are being treated uh, fairly. And that's not good for police either. And what I've said is we have to address that. And we have to address that honestly. But I think that the, the one thing that uh, all of us need to do, you and me, uh, is to make sure that we don't pretend as if there aren't potential problems in how uh, police in certain communities interact and that when we raise those issues or people raise those issues that the perception is somehow that that's anti-police. That's I think uh, what I've tried to express. And I completely agree with you, the protesters have to be peaceful. It's counterproductive if you're not. And if we also acknowledge the fear that communities feel, if uh, a parent sends their kid out to the store and they're not sure whether they're going to have a bad interaction that results in a tragic death, if, if we can just acknowledge this isn't a matter of 
uh, us versus them, but it's a matter of all of us together as Americans working to solve this problem, then I think we will solve it. It's going to take a while to get to the point where we want to be, but nobody's more hopeful than me. I'm, I'm, I'm Mr. Hope when it comes to these issues. I mean, I, 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 I've said from the start that we are not as divided as we seem, and I think we're going to solve it. But we have to understand that in a country of 300 million people, where the police interact millions of times with individuals, black and white and Hispanic and Asian and Middle Eastern, that they're going to be, you know, they're going to be some problems. And we shouldn't shy away from that, but I am absolutely hopeful that we're going to solve it. But, but I just want to make this point. Uh, particularly for young people. Things are much better than they used to be. They're much better than they used to be. Uh, you know, if, if you think about, for example, crime rates. Under my presidency, violent crime rates have dropped precipitously. We have some of the lowest murder rates today uh, than any time since the 1960s. Much less violent generally in our communities than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. That's a sign of hope. And some of that is because of some excellent policing that's been done and communities that are working with police. So we can make progress. It's just we have to be steady about it uh, and make sure that all of us take responsibility rather than worrying about Okay, I want to make sure that I blame somebody else for the problem. That way I don't have responsibility for the solution. You said you're the most hopeful. Absolutely. There might be someone in this room who equals your hope. What? Clifton Kinney. He's 19 years old. And Clifton, could you stand up for me? Good to see you, Cliff. As you know, Mr. President, he's with Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. from Ferguson. Uh, you've witnessed so much in that city. And Clifton, you were in the sixth grade when President Obama was elected? Yes. You had a thank, lot you, of... thank you for that, David. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not the only thank one, you, Aging. Thank you for reminding me that I'm getting older. What were your hopes for this president, and what would you still like to see? Hello, Mr. President. Um, I would like to thank you for your service and for personally inspiring me as a young organizer from Ferguson. I was 17 when I started organizing Ferguson, and now I'm a sophomore at Howard University. Um, uh, my question for you today is... What do you envision safety looks like for poor black and brown communities as we understand that it is more expensive than policing? And um, what can you do as you are about to exit office? What can you do to ensure that that vision um, has groundwork for more progress? Sure. Well, it's a great question. Um, one, one of the interesting things, Clifton, uh, that I know Chief Brown said in Dallas, but I hear this from chiefs uh, and rank and file all across the country, is that we expect police to solve a whole range of societal problems that we ourselves have neglected. So, and I mentioned this in my remarks uh, at the memorial in, in Dallas, uh, we have communities without jobs, with substandard schools, where uh, the drug trade is so often uh, considered the only way to make money. Communities that are inundated with guns, where there's a lack of mental health services or drug treatment services. And then we say to the police, go deal with that, keep it out of sight, keep it out of mind, and then if we put the police in that, those difficult situations and something happens, understandably, the police feel as if they're being attacked because we haven't provided them a situation in which it's easier for them to do their jobs. Some uh, departments have done a very smart thing, and that is to start working more closely with the public health uh, organizations in their community because it turns out that for example 25 to 30 percent of shootings involving police are with somebody who has 
serious mental health problems. But nobody's provided them treatment ahead of time. Making sure that we're providing jobs and training. One of the things that we've done is try to set up something called uh, My Brother's Keeper. And it's uh, an umbrella for efforts in cities all across the country whereby uh, community leaders, churches, and police departments can reach out to young men who are at risk and provide them with mentoring and apprenticeships and job training. So all those things, all those dimensions, when they work and communities feel as if there's more hope, are going to automatically reduce tensions between police and those communities. Uh, but it, that requires resources. Because the one thing that we do have to acknowledge is, is that in some of these very poor communities, um, you know, there's more violence. There's more violence. You, you've got young people in, in the south side of Chicago, uh, maybe half a mile from where I, I live, where my house is, in my mother-in-law's neighborhood, where you hear gunshots every night. You have 14, 15 year old kids who have firearms. It's easier to get a gun than it is to get access to a computer or a book. And if we're going to do something about that, then we've got to provide uh, resources ahead of time. And increasingly, we've got a society that has become more unequal. So, in some cities, for example, the better off you are, you just send your kid to a private school. And then the public schools are underfunded and people don't really want to support public schools. Uh, and that mindset has to change where we, we get back to a sense that we're all one family and one community. And I don't care how well off you are, your son or daughter, uh, even if they're getting everything from you, they're still living in the community. And at, at some point, if, if they are getting all kinds of opportunities and the kid just a mile away is getting none that's going to create problems it's going to it's going to create uh, more challenges thank you very much Clifton, thank, thank you. you thank you it's not lost on us that there are so many parents uh, in this room mothers and fathers searching for the answers to help keep these conversations going and i'm joined by my colleague from ESPN Jamel Hill with a concerned mom Jamel I'm here. Um, thank you, Mr. President, by the way, and thank you, David. I'm here with Karen Sharp and also with Terry George. Uh, these women represent the mothers of police officer. Uh, Karen Sharp, uh, her son, Michael Slager, is awaiting trial uh, concerning the shooting death of Walter Scott in North Charleston. And Terry George, her son, Timothy, is a 25-year-old police officer in Baltimore. Now, during the Freddie Gray unrest, a brick was thrown through her son's car. And Terry would like to ask you a, a question, Mr. President, about the safety of police officers. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Um, as the mom of a police officer, I would just like to know how you're supposed to feel every day when your son puts on a police uniform and he's an honest police officer. He goes out in the community every day and he's a personal police officer. He uses the word sir, ma'am. He walks the beat. He gets to know the community. But, you know, during the, the Freddie Gray situation, you know, he had water bottles thrown at him. He had rocks. He had a brick thrown through his window. He had glass in his eye, but he was still out there. What's he supposed to do? You know, what's he supposed to do to protect himself? I don't know. It just seemed like nobody was there to, to protect him. Well, the, uh, first of all, uh, I think you should feel proud because uh, he is, he's a public servant and he sounds like a wonderful young man and he's doing the right thing. Um, I have to say uh, I was surprised that uh, you actually have a son old enough to be a police officer, but that's, uh, that's, that's a whole other topic. Um, but the, um, you know, if you, if you look at a, a situation like Baltimore, um, there is, and I've said this before, I, 
there are not excuses for the kinds of violent activities that we see in response to anything. In part, and I've said this, uh, I said this when it was happening, it's tearing down the very communities that uh, actually need to be built up. You know, I, I have a staff person in the White House whose mother lives in Baltimore in some of the areas where uh, some of these disturbances took place. She's elderly. She had uh, a CVS, I think it was, which was right down the street where she could fill her prescriptions. And when that gets torn up, now suddenly she's got to figure out how to get to some uh, filler prescriptions two miles or three miles or five miles away. So it's counterproductive. And uh, it, for good police officers who are genuinely are taking the time to get to know the community, um, the community has to stand up for them and speak out on their behalf and recognize that they are partners in this process. Uh, one of the challenges we end up having, though, is, is that if in some of these communities in Baltimore, all these tensions have built up for so long, in part for the reasons that I just mentioned to Clifton, you know, too many unemployed folks, too many drugs on the streets, too many guns, uh, too many idle hands, uh, then Sometimes what happens with uh, an event like Freddie Gray, it becomes the catalyst for all the other stuff that may not even have to do with policing coming out. And, and, and that's why it's so important for us to do everything we can to create healthy communities. That will make life easier for your son. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you know, he deserves a word of thanks. And something that I do believe police officers don't hear enough uh, is thank you. They, when they, when they do the right thing, when they save a life, when they help somebody in need, um, we can't take that for granted. We got to be willing to hold them up uh, as, as, as role models. And, and the best police departments, uh, one of the things that they're doing that's very smart is starting to send police officers into schools, not when there's a disturbance, not when s somebody has a problem, but they're sending them into these schools so the kids, when they're still six, seven, eight, nine, ten, start getting to know police officers. And it turns out some of them end up wanting to be police officers. And, and I hope that. Uh, your son knows how much we appreciate the good work that he's done. Thank you. Thank you both for coming today. And you know, she brings up a very important point about worrying about her own young son uh, now patrolling the streets. There was another mother uh, from Baltimore that the country learned of very quickly in the unrest after Freddie Gray. And I wanted to remind everybody in this room what she did when she saw her son. Baltimore, April of last year. Yeah! Freddie Gray died after being transported in a police van. His death setting off fierce protests. In that crowd, a teenager whose mother spotted him on television, and then everyone saw her. <laughs> Going to find her son to bring him home. The hashtag unleashed mom of the year. People had very strong reactions to that piece of video, and Toya is with us. Toya, could you please stand? You have a microphone and you have the floor. Millions of people watched you, and that hashtag was immediate, Mom of the Year. I, I just want to say, um, first, thank you for doing this. My heart is real heavy when I look at the news, and I look at the news four, five, and six. I'm a single mom. I have one son and five girls. <coughs> And it is so hard trying to keep them out of home way when you're trying to, you know, keep a job and, and, and do right. 
And then you see, I see my son doing what he was doing. I wasn't brought up and raised like that. I was brought up and raised with Officer Friendly. So, you know, um, when I see him do that, you know, it just, it's not, it's not what I expected out of him. Um, what I do understand is the rage that a lot of these young kids are going through in Baltimore City. I've seen a lot, I'm 44 years old, and I've seen a lot, President Obama, that's been going on, rather it's with the police department and these young black men, or just the men killing the men. And so my question to you is, I live right in the heart of Drill Avenue and North Avenue, right where Freddie Gray was murdered, and I have to work as a single mother what can I do? Well, first of all, uh, that's your son right next to you, right? The, uh, Michael, you want to stand up? up? See, Michael, you're, 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 I was raised by a single mom, and I noticed in the video it said boss on there, <laughs> uh, on her necklace, and that, uh, that, that, that sends, sends a good message. Uh, uh, you know, I think that part of the challenge we've got is that you as a single mom who's working and trying to raise a son, five daughters, uh, don't have as much support as you need. Um, and part of that support is making sure that schools are safe. Part of that support is making sure that there are programs for your son and daughters after school because you may be working and uh, you want to make sure that they're in some place that's constructive and teaching them something and, and providing uh, positive, uh, positive values and reinforcing what you're teaching at home. But I can tell that uh, you got uh, your son's attention because he, he seems like he's doing okay now. But uh, uh, and, and, and part of what we as, as a society have to communicate to our young people is we love them, we care about them, and we have high expectations for them. And we part of those expectations is that they behave and they act right. But it's, a, it, it's just easier if the society as a whole is trying to support and reinforce uh, what uh, parents are trying to do as well. Parents have to parent, and uh, you know, you know, what you learn in the home ultimately is going to be more important than anything, but, uh, you know, they've got to have reinforcement. They've got to have support. All right. Thank you. And you've got to remember who's boss. Well, that's always the case. Absolutely. Thank you both. We talk about these conversations we have in the home, and thanks, Deb. But one of the conversations that we've reported on in the last few days is, is one that a lot of households in this country are unaware of, and that's what some people call the talk about how you prepare your kids if they do have an encounter with the police. And there was a, a video that's now been seen 35 million times uh, by a country music singer who's in the audience tonight. But let's look at the video first. He, he was instructing people what to do if they get pulled over. You have to have your ID pulled out before the cop gets there. Because if you're reaching down, as he walks up, you could be pulling a weapon, which is going to compromise his safety, which is going to make his adrenaline go up. Slow and steady, reach for your license. My license is on my dash, and so is my registration. It's here. And I Other hand on the wheel, fingers out. Done. Say that your wallet is on the right-hand side behind your back. Reach for your wallet. From this angle, he could be pulling a weapon. If he's pulling here, it's the same place as if you would have a gun. Coffee Anderson, your, your cowboy hat gives you away, so why don't you stand up. Your video has been seen by millions, uh, well received by many, but there has been some criticism of it as well, saying why should anyone have to be taught a lesson on how to get pulled over by police? But I'm curious what you made of the reaction to it and what you would like to ask the president. Mr. President, thank you for being here. Honored to meet you, sir. Um, I learned this protocol from uh, my father, who was a white correctional officer in the state of Texas. So he had this talk for me because he understood that my um, situation of getting pulled over would be very different than his. And he wasn't blind to the reality of where our country was at that time. So my question to you, Mr. President, is um, have you ever been pulled over? And what was your experience like as a driver? Well, uh, uh, the answer is yes, I have been pulled over. Um, 
I, and I will say that uh, the overwhelming majority of the time, I deserved to be pulled over because <laughs> I was going too fast. Um, and the police officers were courteous. And uh, I um, and I got a ticket, which I deserve. There have been a couple of times in my life where that was not the case. Um, and so my experience of driving is like my experience generally as I was growing up. Obviously now I'm the president, so uh, if people aren't treating me right, it's usually, you know, on the, it's, it's usually on the news or... Wait a minute, you know, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Not David. But, uh, um, but look, when I was 10 years old, I, I, I lived in Hawaii, much more forgiving environment than a lot of kids who were growing up. Uh, and I lived with my grandmother uh, and my grandparents, uh, who were white, older. They lived in, on the 10th floor. And I still remember when I was 10 years old, uh, walking into the elevator and there was a woman who I thought knew me and as soon as I walked on and, and she lived on my grandparents floor hmm. when I walked on she got off and I was puzzled <laughs> and I, I said do you want to come up and she said no and then I went up and then I saw the elevator going back down and I just kind of peeked out the the peephole and I could see she came right back up but was just worried about yeah. riding an elevator with you. Yeah. Uh, and then over time you start learning uh, as you're crossing the street suddenly the locks start going on doors. Um, and I do think that in that sense what is, what is true for me is, is true for a lot of uh, African American men is there there is a, there's there's a greater presumption of dangerousness that arises from uh, you know the social and cultural perceptions that have been fed to folks uh, for a long time, and I think it is not as bad as it used to be, but it's still there. And there's a history to that. And I think it's important for us not to completely overreact every time something happens. On the other hand, that presumption can also lead to really dangerous situations. And it's not uh, just in interactions with police, but that's the, the time where it feels most consequential. So the question, I think, uh, for, for all of us is uh, how do we try to lessen those barriers and those misunderstandings and and some of it involves uh, us being very conscious of our assumptions because you know, black folks and Latino folks also carry some assumptions you know, they're, 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 you'll be, you, you may see a, pol uh, a police officer who's doing everything right and you automatically assume the worst rather than the best in him True. and and we have to guard against that as well uh, and that has to be reflective in how we talk about uh, these issues going forward but uh, you also look very sharp in that hat I <laughs> thank you mr. president appreciate it Thank you. Okay. And Mr. President, we, I know your time is valuable. We just have a couple more people sure. we want to get to. Absolutely. Uh, Milwaukee Police Chief Edward Flynn is with us in the room. And Chief Flynn, if you could stand up. Uh, you have said something because so much of what this town hall is about is trying to find a way to bridge the divide. But you said, quote, without any hyperbole, police officers in American cities care more about black lives than any other institution. Police officers of America cities are the only ones dying to protect black lives. I'm curious what you mean by that and what you expect to see in, in the final six months of this presidency. Uh, a lot's expected of you, Mr. President, and uh, <clears throat> why should I be any exception? Well, I, as Michelle said, I volunteered for the job, so I can't <laughs> complain. Um, I'm basically going to ask you to figure out a way to uh, 
uh, cross parallel conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to transcend the duration of your presidency, right. which imposes a special burden of you on you because of your unique place in history. The parallel conversations you've in fact implicitly alluded to in the course of our conversation today. For the urban police chiefs in America, we are primarily judged by our ability to lower levels of violence in disadvantaged communities of color. In those communities, crime has not significantly gone down. It's gone down in some place called America. But in those neighborhoods, there's easy access to firearms, to which you've alluded, and there are extraordinary rates of violence. Nationally, African Americans represent 51% of our homicide victims Right. with about 13 percent of the population and our cities is more like 80 percent right. and like most homicides offenders look like the people that they victimize right. it's an urban tragedy but the heart of the police dilemma is those neighborhoods that demand our services need us the most request us the most depend upon us the most for social and historical reasons distrust us right. and when there's a series of critical incidents like we've recently seen that distrust is in high relief we can't protect them effectively if we're not trusted and the police are needed, as you've said, right. in those neighborhoods. And so the challenge is, how do we talk about both things at the same time without la acting like we're blaming the African-American community for their victimization or that we're assuming that all police are racially biased? I understand the Black Lives Matter movement exists because there's a sensibility that black lives didn't matter. All right. And that's for a number of social and historical reasons. It gets to exist and to advance that agenda. Doesn't mean anybody else's life doesn't um, doesn't matter. But for us, the problem's this: all there is is the police in the community. There's no cavalry coming. Right. Many of our cities are in states that are dominated by interests that act like the cities are the enemy. Right. State legislators want to help us help us do something about guns. All right, what was that man doing with an assault rifle? I mean, fine, go to the funeral of the five cops. But how did, that how did that guy get that assault rifle, and why could he walk down the street with it and then use it? Okay, that requires some political courage. It requires mass movements. There's a lot of moving pieces here. Yeah. So we have to work together. We know that. And everything that divides us makes us all more vulnerable. Makes the police more vulnerable. Makes the community more vulnerable. They're the ones that need us the most. And so the challenge, the easy challenge I offer you, in the next six months, but also I would hope, I would also hope beyond that, yeah. is to use your authority, your influence, and your prestige as a convener to continue this discussion, because I don't think things are going to get enlightened during this election, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and so that conversation is going to have to take place parallel to this election yeah. and beyond it if we're going to make that joint progress because those neighborhoods depend upon us for their safety and the police depend upon those neighborhoods for their safety. Well, I, I, I appreciate what you said, Chief. Let, let me just uh, pick up on a couple of themes that you said. Um, number one, uh, it is absolutely true that the murder rate in the African American community is way out of whack compared to the general population and both the victims and the perpetrators are are black young black men uh, the uh the 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 single greatest cause of death for young black men between the ages of 18 and 35 is homicide and that's crazy that is crazy and and so we have to acknowledge that and that means that we can't put the burden on the police alone. You, it, it is going to require investments in those communities. It is going to require making sure the schools work. It's going to require having after school programs. And then it's, it is going to require us to look at things like guns. Now, this is tough. I, 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 I have presided over more memorials of mass shootings than I, uh, I would like. Um, and it's heartbreaking. But that doesn't even count the hundreds of kids just in the south side of Chicago who've been shot. And part of what makes the police 
community interaction so fraught with potential danger is because police officers who have a right to come home so that mom's not worried they are aware of the fact that there's just a lot of guns washing around there and they don't know what might happen which means you're going to be a little your adrenaline is going to be a little higher and it's going to be tougher now the truth is is that the politics of uh, firearms and having a conversation about this right now is very difficult uh, you know in the lieutenant governor's home state you know you've got open carry laws I, it, it, it is a testament to the professionalism of the Dallas Police Department that more people did not get shot because when the snipers started shooting you had people in the protests who were carrying long rifles and so they weren't even sure who was doing the shooting um, so we do have to make sure that we're thinking about making these communities healthy generally and not see that as separate from uh, police community relations and I will do so now the uh, the, the one thing I do have, uh, I'll, I'll just take uh, take a moment to say two other things uh, number one I know that there's some who have criticized even the phrase black lives matter as if the notion is is that other lives don't matter and so you get you know all lives matter or blue lives matter I I, I, I understand uh, the point they're trying to make I think it's important for us to also understand that the the phrase black lives matter simply refers to the notion that there's a specific vulnerability for African Americans that needs to be addressed yeah. it's not meant to, to to suggest that other lives don't matter uh, it, it's to suggest that other other folks aren't experiencing this particular vulnerability and I, and so we shouldn't get too caught up in this notion that somehow um, people who are asking for f fair treatment are somehow automatically uh, anti-police are trying to only look out for black lives as opposed to others I, I think we have to be careful about playing that game just because that's not obviously what is intended uh, the final point I will make is that if chief you are reaching out to the community ahead of time doing all the work you're doing and have built trust that doesn't guarantee that when something like this happens there's still not going to be a flare-up because there's a lot of pent-up frustration uh, in a lot of these communities and there are times where people are irresponsible in uh, how they uh, try to address it the one thing I, I can tell you I hear more often than anything though that I think would be helpful on the police side would be uh, initiating investigations that people feel are uh, transparent and uh, uh, certain and that in involves state prosecutors and investigators just treating these things seriously when an event like this happens uh, in the same way that I expect any uh, Black Lives Matter person to express sincere sorrow if a police officer is shot I think it's useful for police departments when something happens without in any way compromising an investigation just expressing real grief and sorrow that that there was a loss um, kindness and compassion particularly coming from uh, the two sides expressed across this divide that, that makes a big difference because sometimes I, sometimes people just want acknowledgement 
They, they want to feel as if their concerns uh, are being heard and are and, and resonate. Uh, it, so. And I got to say, we saw so much of that in Dallas. The protesters who then showed up at those patrol cars that became a moving tribute that grew before our eyes. Mr. President, we have just one final moment before we let everyone go today. And it involves a mother who wanted to be here from Dallas. She brought her boys to that protest, which, as many point out, was peaceful until that moment. Uh, and then she was shot. And the only reason she survived with her boys was because of the officers who, who dove in to help her. And, and here's that mother, what she told the nation. I said, yes, sir, I'm, I'm hitting my leg. And, and the other officer jumped on top of me and covered me and my son. And they just, they stayed there with us. And I saw another officer. <laughs> saw another officer get shot right there in front of me again. That was two. And her sons are here today. And Jamar, I would just ask that you stand up for a moment. And if you wouldn't mind, will you just share with the president your plans now, given what's happened these last few days? I wanted to be a police officer when I get older. And that the reason I want to be a police officer is that I want to try to make this world a better place as much as I can. And that <clears throat> I want to, like, tell kids and adults that not all police officers are bad. Some police officers make mistakes. And that's just what I want to tell people. Well... Uh, I think you'll make an outstanding police officer. I met your mom uh, and your dad, and they were very proud of you. Um, uh, now that sh uh, her leg is laid up, mm -hmm. she's expecting help from you around the house. Because yes, uh, my understanding is your dad's still got to work. Uh, he he, he uh, drives a tow truck. Yes, sir. So he's gone a lot, and and you, you got a lot of brothers and uh, well, what do you got? Five in yes, the house. Sir. So uh, I, I, since po police are there to uh, serve and protect, you can start practicing now by serving your mom, <laughs> doing some dishes, maybe cooking a little bit. Um, but uh, but we're very proud of you. I, I will say this, David. Uh, I met uh, this family immediately after I had met with the families of the fallen officers that we were memorializing. And that's always the hardest thing I do as president, uh, trying to, to comfort a, a family who's just lost somebody and comfort kids who are the same age as you. Um, so you had some white children who had lost their father. You had uh, Latino children who had lost their father. You have African American families who have lost their fathers. And I can tell you the grief is the same. The loss is the same. And when I'm hugging those kids and telling them it's going to be okay, the only way I can deliver on that promise is if we make sure that all of us are looking out for all of those children. We've got, we have an obligation to them each and every one of them. And that is something that I'm committed to, not just as President of the United States, but as a father myself. And I hope that all of us, over the coming weeks and months and years, uh, take that same approach. These are all our kids, and we want an America where they feel safe and loved and cared for. All right? Jamar, thank you. The police chief says he's hiring. <laughs> have to wait a few years. All right. Mr. President, thank you. I want to thank everyone watching, both in this country and around the world, and to every family that gathered here in this room tonight. We salute your bravery and your courage to come here and share your stories with the President. And Mr. President, it's an honor, and we thank you. The conversation's you, just begun here. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.